Hi, this is Mark Birch, and today I'm going to be taking a look at Act 1, Scene 7, just the first part, uh, just uh, Macbeth's soliloquy, because this is a really important scene. I've already looked at the significance of euphemisms when dealing with Act 1, Scene 5, Part 1, and the same's true here in Act 1, Scene 7, although even more so, there are a huge number of euphemisms that Shakespeare ascribes to Macbeth in this opening soliloquy. Macbeth clearly can't bring himself to refer to murder. He knows how evil it is. Uh, the act of regicide is appalling to him, and so he uses a variety of other terms in order to reference that act. On the surface, Macbeth's first statement, if it were done, when it is done, then to a well it were done quickly, is basically saying, if I'm going to do this, I better do it quickly. But it reveals an awful lot more below the surface. Um, first of all, you have the two vague pronouns, it, used to euphemistically refer to the murder. But also, we've got this biblical allusion to the words of Jesus uh, to Judas in John 13, 27. Um, in that biblical reference, we have, that thou doest do quickly. So, we could argue that Shakespeare's drawing a parallel between Macbeth as Judas. Macbeth is the betrayer of King Duncan, just as Judas was the betrayer of the King of Kings. And so to rank Macbeth with Judas is to present him as the worst of possible villains. And this, of course, is how he's viewing himself at this stage. We're then presented with an extended conditional that can be quite confusing. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his cease success, and so on. Um, here we've essentially got the idea that if the killing of Duncan would end all of the consequences, that it would be the be-all and end-all, then Macbeth would proceed with what he's going to talk about in a moment. But what's interesting, one of the interesting things here, is the use of the word trammel. Trammel means to tangle in a net, and it's the start of an extended metaphor of the sea or of water that we start with here. Um, it's about catching the consequences. And there are also interesting phonological devices that are being used here. For example, with his cease success, the sibilance is so overwhelming that you get a sense of being caught up in it in the same way that the consequences are being caught up in the net. And you could argue that you get a similar effect from the alliteration of the cuss sounds in uh, consequence and catch. The extended metaphor or conceit of water is concluded here with the reference to the way in which life on earth is manifest as opposed to the afterlife. The afterlife is eternal, it goes on and on, and yet what Macbeth uses here are language associated with the limited nature of the waterways of the earthly existence, the bank and shoal of time. Well, these are limitations, these are the shallow waters or the banks, so you get a sense of the earthly life being limited, it's short-lived. And despite that, Macbeth considers that if the consequence of killing the king were that process of committing the murder, then he would be prepared to jump the life to come, to ignore any consequences in the afterlife, and deal with the fact that he has his reward in this very limited earthly sphere. However, Macbeth says that in these cases we still have judgment here. And here's an important word. It's been used twice already in this soliloquy, and on both occasions it's been referring to the earthly sphere. And I think that's true here as well. So basically Macbeth's saying that he can still be judged in this realm as well as in the afterlife, that it won't be the be-all and end-all. In fact, we but teach bloody instructions which, being taught, return to plague the inventor. In other words, the violence that, we, violence that we use against others returns to us. What goes around comes around. We're going to receive our just desserts. The same concept is expressed in a different metaphor that follows. It commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. Once again, the violence, the death that you meet are out comes back to haunt you. So having considered whether it's actually worth committing the act of regicide, Macbeth moves on to a consideration of Duncan's qualities. 
and recognises that he's here in double trust. Um, the first of these two reasons is that he's his kinsman and his subject. Um, so therefore, Duncan would trust Macbeth because Macbeth is his cousin and because Macbeth is his subject. And so he owes his allegiance and loyalty to Duncan rather than being the person who should commit murder against him. Uh, the second thing is that he's his host and as his host, he owes him protection. As he puts it, he should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. The argument then moves on from... Duncan's relationship to Macbeth to the qualities of Duncan himself. Uh, Macbeth says that Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, in other words he's been so humble in the application of his powers, and he's been so clear in his great office, clearly an accomplished king, that his virtues will plead like angels trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. Again, a euphemism for killing him, taking off. But we get that simile, we'll plead like angels. Uh, the semantic field of heaven is employed. Uh, Duncan's uh, killing will sound some kind of clarion call in heaven because of how wrong it is. It will be trumpet-tongued, incredibly loud, because this is such an evil act. Pity's personified as being like a naked newborn babe. So we get a sense of that vulnerability and the desire to evoke pity through that personification. And it's described as striding the blast, you know, it's carried on through the murder of Duncan. And this idea is carried to everyone in the earthly realm through heaven's cherubim, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air. In other words, Shakespeare's using the idea of the cherubim, these angelic figures, being horsed or carried on the winds, the sightless couriers of the air, so that they're going everywhere. Um, their message is ubiquitous, that the murder of Duncan is a terrible thing and everyone should feel pity, everybody should be horrified by it. Uh, they will blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. This hyperbolic reference to the fact that everyone's anguish at hearing of the murder of Duncan is such that it will drown the sound of the wind itself. Having just used the image of heaven's cherubim horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, Macbeth extends that imagery to describe his own ambition, stating, I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent. After reasoning with himself through the soliloquy, he recognises that he hasn't got the impetus to go through with committing such a terrible act. All he has is ambition, which again, he describes in terms of um, a horse jumping, vaulting ambition, which is getting beyond itself. It's going further than it should. He's recognizing the hubris that lies behind his ambition so that um, it could fall on the other side. It could topple uh, rather than lead him to victory. This might also remind us of Act 1, Scene 4, when Macbeth heard the news about the Prince of Cumberland being named and stated, that's a step on which I must fall down or else owe a leap. The iambic pentameter is killed by the entrance of Lady Macbeth. Um, as soon as Macbeth has said and falls on the other, she enters. And all of the figurative language, all of the philosophical considerations of Macbeth are destroyed and his language returns to the rather prosaic, how now? What news? Okay, ciao.